The Lost in Transition podcast is brought to you by LB Endurance. LB Endurance, turning you into a legit badass. Learn more today at lbendurance.com. You know, I know that, okay, I had, you know, I had shawarma for dinner. I must so, say, if you do say shawarma one more time, we're charging them for a sponsor. I've so never good. even Probably had it. it. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to the Lost in Transition podcast. I'm your host, Chris Gerard. Derek Tingle is here this week. Lanaburl is out, but uh, we're glad to have you along with us. You can subscribe to the show, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, the TuneIn Radio app, YouTube, and Facebook, all available for listening. Also available at the website, losttransition.com. Follow us on social media and connect with us there. Let us know what you'd like to hear on upcoming shows. Got a special guest tonight, Andrea Kendrick. She's a registered dietitian, nutritionist, helping people reach their nutrition goals through sound evidence-based nutrition strategies. She works with individual clients as well as sports teams and corporate employee wellness programs. We're glad to have her here to talk about how to figure out how to separate nutrition fact from fiction and differentiate between what's just trendy and what's fundamental to the function of a healthy athlete. Andrea, welcome to Lost in Transition. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So the first thing that always is just so difficult to figure out for people sometimes is where to even start in finding reliable nutrition information. You can't get online without being bombarded with the, you know, the seven new superfoods. Don't eat this, eat that. And, and it seems wildly contradictory, you know, just for a a lay person out there trying to figure this out, what are some ways to kind of know if you're looking at something that is uh, legitimate or maybe a little overhyped or sketchy? Right, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And in our area, the Knox County Health Department has actually taken this on because there's a lot of web misinformation. So trying to put out those resources that are the go-to places. As a dietitian, I'm going to go to our National Academy as the first resource for eatright.org. So this is the National Academy of Registered Dietitians in all practice areas. So we're in an area right here talking about triathletes, right? So sports nutrition. A subset of the National Academy is called SCAN, and it is an acronym for sports nutrition, cardiovascular, and wellness um, is all part of that. So that would be a great place to go. I was just poking around on that website in preparation for today, and they've got a really inexpensive fact sheets on hydration. Um, It's probably going to come up later, but the low-carb, high-fat diet $3.50, right, for this PDF of evidence-based research. So that's going to be a really great place to look, scan. Um, And also the CPSDA, (laughs) quite a CPSDA, okay. I'm writing that down now for the show notes. (laughs) Yes. So this is a group of dietitians that oftentimes are a part of SCAN as well. And they are dietitians that work with your Division I or maybe even Division II collegiate sports okay professional athletes as well so you're tennessee right the sports dietitian for tennessee she is a part of this organization auburn you know all all your big colleges right so this is going to be a go-to place for athletes as well cpsda so condensing that down almost it uh basically you're looking for something that is peer-reviewed credentialed and that kind of leads into my next point too uh as we mentioned in the intro you are an rd which is registered dietitian and we always have to explain to people the difference between nutritionist which is honestly i think a label that pretty much anyone can attach to themselves with little or no experience and registered dietitian can you explain a little bit about you know the difference in what you went through as far as education to get those credentials right to become a registered dietitian you first do have a degree a college degree a four-year degree um, in nutrition it's a didactic program and it then allows you to apply for internships um, which are can vary in length of time but there's a subset of core requirements for those internships. After the internship, you can then sit for your exam and then you'll have continuing education you have to do every five years to keep your credentials as a dietitian. So I love when we go back to kind of talking about that first question of finding nutrition information, even if it is on, let's say, um, WebMD. Right. Who is the author and what are the credentials behind it? And if it's a registered dietitian, that's going to be someone or it'll say RD. And maybe it might say comma LD or LDN. That just means they're licensed in their state. And um, they have had that education for the college degree, the internship afterwards, and then have sat for their exam. It is now becoming encouraged to that um, dietitians get a master's. So you'll start to see more MS, Mm -hmm. comma RD, right? 
um, or um, MPH, like a master's in public health type of thing. Right. So you'll see those credentials kind of get a little bit more complicated, but RD, registered dietitian. So gotcha. not to say that the nutritionist hasn't studied as long, but it could potentially be a weekend certification or right. it could be someone that has studied the same length of time, but for whatever reason, hasn't gone on to that education. So press in and ask those questions. How long have they studied? Are they licensed right in the state? And do they have to keep their education current through continuing education credits would be encouraged. So very cool. So, okay, here's my thing. So I spend a lot of time on Facebook. We all do. Yes. Um, you come across so much stuff, clickbait articles, like, like Chris was talking about the, you know, seven super magic wonder foods that you have to eat right now. Or you're triathletes gonna... are terrible for this too. And we love <clears throat> trendy stuff. Exactly. Right. We're, we're gearheads. So like anything, yeah. we're like, Ooh, this is new and exciting. Okay. We'd go eat grass off the lawn if we thought it would give us an advantage. <laughs> no, we would. wouldn't. I wouldn't <laughs> anyway. So anyway, why do you think when there are play, when there are people out there like you, yeah. um, why do you think so many people are willing to just willy nilly click on whatever they want to on Facebook and go, Ooh, I should try this because Facebook says so rather than actually seeking out real information from someone who's actually studied this. Right. I think that we're always all looking for a quick fix, whether it's the athletes or for weight loss, right? We all want the magic pill that's going to boost performance or cause fat burn or whatever it may be. And the superfoods usually do have some good nutrition to them, right? If you look at the superfoods, they're plant-based foods that have a lot of vitamins, a lot of minerals to them, and, and they're not offensive things to a quote-unquote healthy diet that a lot of dietitians would recommend, you know? Oh, uh, if you look at the superfoods, you know, it's gonna be like acai, chai seeds, right? Nutritional yeast, kale, avocados, blueberries, right? Salmon, like I love all those things. Right, but I'm to say that now. it's going yeah. to salmon. I had salmon last night. Oh, salmon mm. tonight for dinner too. Mm. I love salmon. I'm starting to feel bad about my shawarma that I had on the way over here. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> Get out right now. Hey, you're <laughs> human. You're human. It's all good. Um, but those things are good. They're whole foods. But we have to remember kind of the combination of nutrients. There, they shouldn't be your only foods. You know, it shouldn't be that you only eat these things and maybe discard a completely. Um, different group of foods um, or, or, or category of nutrients like the carbs tend to get picked on, right? Like, don't eat carbs. They're so bad for <laughs> you, right? So, And then we know, obviously, on this side of the sport, like, if you don't eat carbs, you're going to run out of energy oh, very quickly. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and so that has to be taken into consideration. I think that a lot of this stuff, the hard part is, is that information out there has some truth to it. And, and that's what can make it hard. But all the more reason why you should go with someone who has their credentials, has the background to be able to educate you on finding the best balance. And that's my buzzword balance. I mm -hmm. really don't like healthy. I want balanced, right? And it depends on what the, your goals are, right? Mm -hmm. When you're in season, you really should be fueling your sport. It shouldn't be the time to make changes to like body composition, right? This is not a good time to start cutting fat necessarily at this point in time. Do that in the off season, right? Fuel your body for performance right now in the in season, okay? There's so there's a periodization to what your fueling should look like, and it's not the same. 365. Right? Periodization is a very very good word too when it comes to describing this because that's so applicable to training as well. Right. You know, it, you, your body is just not made to continually grind along doing one thing. TFN. So right. it's interesting. It makes perfect sense that nutrition also follows those needs it as does. well. Yeah. Seems uh, like it's also that's putting something like nutrition in the realm of something that we athletes can understand. Like we could actually put it in training peaks, like like that other <laughs> right. like that other thing that we can do uh, and obsess about numbers. Right. right. <laughs> and Just there another is thing there's to think nutrition about. periodization. I mean, yeah. There, there really, really is, regardless of the sport. Um, and and of course, as y'all know, it's never the time to really start doing drastic change to nutritional intake or fueling during during peak season time so. certainly i know i mean obviously i i think any athlete benefits obviously from a, a good nutritional approach and and i will i will make the endorsement that i think any athlete would benefit from seeing you or another registered dietitian that being said obviously not everybody's going to go do it what are some good indications that an athlete would really benefit maybe more than others for expert help i know you know a lot of athletes often think that yeah my diet's fine i'm doing okay and, and obviously the, the persistent thing i've kind of earned the calories <laughs> i've burned right. a lot but then yeah. they struggle with gi distress you know especially mm -hmm. in your longer races uh, or their body composition or their energy and recovery so so what are some things i guess that are you 
you know, would be an indicator of a kind of a red flag, like you need, you need to get this, uh, you know, professionally examined. Right. I'd say that those are definitely the three top key things for sure. And the harder part is, is you may not realize how good you can feel <laughs> until you make changes. Right. And so that that's hard to be like this red flag that you're waiting for to be like, sure, I should go meet with a registered dietitian and talk about my fueling. Um, but I would encourage anyone that's going through sport and wants to take it seriously to, to at least have that initial consultation. Cause I cannot tell you how many times afterwards, two weeks afterwards. Yeah. My energy's better. Yeah. My workout's better. Yeah. I have less bloating or I'm going to the bathroom more frequently. Like, like things you just don't, don't think of like in a good way, going to the bathroom more frequently, right? right. but bathroom talk <laughs> comes up in, in my office. And so, yeah, um, that's uh, that's the bane of triathletes too. We, I think poop talk comes up in here quite frequently, quite, too. way too frequently. Right. It's, it, you know, it's just, you know, naturally happens of course. And it comes with, um, with the territory with me, but if your sport is is serious enough to you, I would say, yeah, meeting with someone and making sure that you're fueling and that your meal pattern is such that it is fueling whatever your goals are. If you have no intention of body composition tra- change, then that's fine. Let's just make sure we're optimally fueling your sport and your performance and getting you to the to the peak that we can. But if you do have body composition change um, goals, then we'd have to talk about doing that, of course, in the off season and what that can look like now, at least in the in season and just keeping a nice little journal. And even if you don't meet with the dietitian, I think that'd be a good kind of starting point to look at your your fueling and how was how was the practice run for that? What did that feel like? Did did it feel weak? Did it feel strong? You felt awesome? Like just kind of putting some of those descriptors on it. I, I think you'll start to be able to see things if you record it a little bit. Um, yeah. it, it, it's obvious to me, and and I think when people start writing it down, it's obvious to them too. So, so. that kind of leads into another another thing was is like meal planning. Yes. Um, obviously, keeping a nutrition journal and things like that are are something that we could all do and and benefit from but you know how do we take that information and say use that to okay now we want to we want to do our meal plan and we want to kind of do our little meal prep for the week or whatever right any tips on how we can kind of aggregate that info into something useful yeah and everyone's schedule is going to be different i think we're dealing with mostly adults that probably that work right yeah and then have a (laughs) part-time job of training on top of everything else right so it's like trying to fit it all in right so we're wanting you to fuel yourself every like two to three hours essentially so what's a meal versus what's a snack before and really centering it around your training times okay so i'd love to give you a visual that you can put up on the website too of these pictures okay of these plates right in terms of how much carbohydrate should you have fruits and vegetables and lean protein depending on what your goals are weight loss weight management has a different sort of picture moderate training has a different sort of picture more or less carbs is the big difference between these Mm -hmm. and then race day or heavy training day okay and it should be such that it's a meal a snack a meal a snack a meal a snack okay now now again most of us have different goals i feel like very few triathlons are going to go for a weight gain goal, right? Right. Yeah. Agree? <laughs> Probably not. Probably well, not like my basketball players no. looking to gain that, weight. Or your weightlifters. Right. I don't think that would be quite what right. we're looking for. Exactly. Not what I would envision. You would have to be dangerously underweight coming into it. That's the only way <laughs> right. I could think of needing to do that. So you're going to be between one of the two plates and you're still going to need to be fueling that. So when are you doing your training? Is it first thing in the morning before you have to go to work? And what does that look like before you exercise or train, right? Um, high carbohydrate is encouraged there, right? Easily digested, post, carbs and protein, right? And then a meal and then maybe a snack and then a meal. Maybe you're going to do another training, right? Because maybe you have to do two in one day, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> or like my three a day that I did earlier this right. week. Yeah. So you're having to fuel a lot, right? And yes. you have to get more carbs because you've tanked out your glycogen stores, right? Your carbs that are stored in your muscle. It's your little gas tank. Every time you're training, boom, they're gone, right? Mm-hmm. Got to eat more carbs, still <laughs> yeah. fill them back up, right? Especially, you know, and especially carbs to be been, a part of that. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, that leads in perfectly to one of the trends that's out there really big in endurance sports, ketogenic diets. Yes. Do they work for anybody? Do they not work for some people? Is it even possible to make it work with an endurance athlete? Right. Um, you know, d- demands that they have on their body. Right, so for those that don't know, the ketogenic diet is essentially having less than 50 grams of carbs. So let's put that into food, right? If you don't know food as well as I do, a banana is 27, okay? Oh, two bananas, okay. So do bananas, you're done, right? (laughs) No more. 
Um, and, and the thought process is here is that it's going to get you to tap into utilizing fat as energy, mm -hmm. which is more sustainable. It really, really mm -hmm. is, right? We The whole reason you're doing the gummies and the chews and all that as you're going through these hours and hours of exercise is because your glycogen stores are tanked, right? And you're trying to give yourself some carbs for energy, okay? So um, the thought process is there that you're relying on the fat. The problem is, is that your intensity is gonna go down, right? So for, for this sport, it wouldn't go well without the use of carbohydrates. And a lot of times ketogenic people, like people that follow a ketogenic diet, even though they are triathletes, will still utilize, right? Like the gels and the goos or dates or bananas, whatever your carb source is, to still have for energy um, there. So um, it, it is a trendy thing. It's not to say that it's completely wrong or false mm -hmm. by any means. And I pulled an awesome fact sheet from the Academy just to make sure that I could, you know, back all this, <laughs> right. this up there. But yeah, carbs is the preferred source of energy, right? Um, but the biggest problem is in terms of performance is that it was going to reduce the intensity. Right. The well, athletes. and certainly uh, carbs are the easiest to obtain and the quickest, I think, acting. Like you say, everything probably has a little grain of truth in it, which is mm -hmm. what makes, you know, myths or, right. or less than ideal information so persistent because it's not so demonstrably, demonstrably false, you right. know, that, uh, but, you know, it's something that for most people, it sounds like the preferred method is going to be just get that balanced carbs. I know we had a, a guest on that was not a nutritionist, just doing stuff for fun, uh, challenge and that she tried to be a paleo vegan wow. <laughs> I, didn't, yes. I didn't know that was even that's possible. super restrictive right you know she did it she did it for a month on a bet basically but and, right. and successfully was training for an iron man at the time that yeah. being said just because it was possible does not mean it was practical right exactly and so it's down here too it's encouraged that you know you don't necessarily do this during competition phase so if you have body composition goal changes maybe look at that in the off season, right? It's not to say that it's going to completely be non-effective, but again, intensity is going to suffer. So performance is gonna suffer, right? Let's not necessarily do that during competition, right? Again, not to say that it's completely wrong or false. There is truth to it, but how do you want it to affect your performance? I guess. Exactly, So exactly. I know athletes, much like pregnant people, can yeah. get cravings. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Especially after the long workout, workouts. I mean, the most classic one, obviously, is like uh, craving for salt during a hard workout. That's an right. obvious, like, very close one. Uh, I, I did the Pistol 50K in uh, March and never had had pickles while running before. And they were amazing at, like, mile 27. <laughs> like, oh, pickles, you pickles, know. Pickles, mustard. You know, anything like that you would just normally not think of. But out, outside of cravings during training for very specific things like right. that you know people just sometimes have it where it's you know i've got to have mm -hmm. food x and you know what it's never it's never a salad nobody ever wants brussels sprouts no one ever why. wants you know <laughs> although i could i could crave a good asparagus right i love brussels right. sprouts i really do really i absolutely I love them i like them too. i've got to work my, my wife it. on the other hand that's like the one food she's like mm -mm, i ain't touching it <laughs> no i'm good so it's in your head in terms mm, of literally mm -hmm. the chemical right. responses to foods, right? What was the pleasure response like? Brussels sprouts for your wife, probably not super high. Not super right? high. So yeah. it's not going to be like, ooh, I crave Brussels sprouts, right, for your <laughs> wife, right? Mm -mm. But something else that does have kind of that, that, that serotonin release. Um, so it's usually something chemically in the brain there. Um, that is that is causing those cravings to occur. And so when they say it's in your head, it is, but it's, yeah. it's more like the chemical responses in your head there. Um, but yeah, the salt thing, going back to that too, very literally that's what the body needs, of right. course, right? Because of excreting of sodium um, via the sweat. So um, I hope that answers your question. Is that something, I, I, think, yeah, I think another question <laughs> to kind of lead in from that is, you know, we, we, if we're keeping our food diary, say, it, yeah. are those things we should track? I mean, could that actually be a, an indication that there's something, there's some sort of deficiency in our meal plan that mm. that's causing our body to, to crave a certain thing? Or is that again, just more of like a, a head thing? And, and I guess it would just, again, depend on your goals, right? If you're at like a healthy weight and it's not any way negatively affecting your performance. If anything, like I'm thinking most of it, like, ooh, I want chocolate, I want ice cream. I'm hearing like carb source there, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm hearing fluids even too right. on ice cream. So I'm not necessarily hearing that as a bad thing unless there's something like, again, weight composition changes that someone someone's wanting to do. 
even with like my non-triathlete type of um, clients that are looking to lose weight, once a week I'm telling them have a cheat meal, right? Mm -hmm. So look at your frequency. If you're like, I can do this every day and you're like feeling like, okay, I'm not getting to the body composition changes I want or it's definitely negatively affecting my performance. Maybe I should look at my frequency here, there. For sure, and I'd say one of the biggest under talked about things is water and the yes, water yeah. needs for everyone. And maybe you're seeking some of those foods out of actually being thirsty, right? And if you really get to the water that you need as an individual and a whole heck of a lot more water needed for your triathlon <laughs> right, right. or triathletes, um, you won't necessarily have room even in your stomach for some of those other Right, foods, I've noticed that. Right? I think my so. record uh, liquid intake on a day was two and a half gallons. That's amazing. Uh, you know, yes. and, and, and I should have been hungry but struggled to get in what I what I needed. Right. Uh, it's interesting what you, you mentioned about the cravings because I, I noticed, and now this kind of almost justifies this in my head in a way, that when I get tired, that craving for carbs and even just yeah. pure crappy sugar it really right. goes up if i'm full of energy and focused and doing stuff you know like not a problem but the moment that i'm just like totally beat it's not right. you know i think part of it is is even just i'm tired and what's easy and what's in front of me but but part of it i think also is the body saying you need energy and you need it now and ice cream's gonna do that you know or whatever yeah. is in front of you so that's interesting that you mentioned that it's interesting with the water too because you know the the uh, the eight glasses a day is out there as that thing, and you hear so passionate low. opinions that right. it's too low. Too low. Uh, even if you have seen that it was too high, you don't really need that much, which I find bizarre. I mean, you, you would have to try so hard to hurt yourself by right. drinking too much, you know. Right. Absolutely. The harm of the harm of being under is far more than that of being over in ninety nine point nine percent of cases. But what, what's a good indicator for water intake? I've heard drink, you know, till you, when you're thirsty, drink, you know, which is a pretty simple approach, but is that enough? Right. And usually when you're thirsty, it's like you're already in that de dehydration state a lot of times. So um, it was great. I actually just did a news interview today or uh, Tuesday um, earlier this week on and water came up. And so 91 ounces to 125 ounces was what was recommended for men and women that are adults not not talking exercise right, right. yeah this is your so this if you is go just and sit at the like, office all day yeah. come home and watch tv right so 91 to 125 ounces so certainly for y'all that are sweating you need a whole heck of a lot more so talking to that sports nutrition side this is the hard part because it's not very applicable but if you could weigh yourself before you do a training <laughs> uh, run by you know whatever you're doing uh tr weigh yourself before weigh yourself after any weight changes water loss right so for every pound you're looking at needing at least 16 ounces of water, you get above two pounds. Now you need electrolytes as part of that, right? This is where you mm. need the Gatorades or, or sports, you know, Powerades, something like that, some kind of sports drink or a homemade sports drink with coconut water and orange juice and sodium. You can also do those kind of things too. So the bare minimum that I would certainly recommend for men would be at least 125 ounces, which is just three ounces shy of a gallon. Call it a gallon. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right? We're close enough. So go ahead and call it a gallon. Exactly. And then what is your sweat rate like? And if you are um, doing exercise as long as most triathlons are or triathletes are during their training, you, of course, are going to need a whole heck of a lot more water and sodium. So whether it's coming from sports drink or getting a little bit liberal with the salt shaker on your foods, one right. or two. So. Well, and, and uh, obviously supplementary salt during races is yes. now a pretty big thing as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know it, it, what the research is as far as it actually, you know, like the evidence of how it does suppress cramping. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know that anecdotally it's been effective for me and other people too. Right. Is, is that, you know, anything about the uh, the cramping side of things and is, is salt actually something that's been shown to prevent that? Or is it more of a psychosomatic reaction of, you know, pouring pure salt in your mouth? Yeah, no, the sodium definitely has. And I'm drawing a blank on the one that NASA was using that was, was so big. What, what are the brands that you're using? I know News the big one, oh, like what, and, and um, you, you or base, whatever. Base salt. Base is, the base one. is probably base the one. biggest one among endurance athletes that I've seen, oh, but I've seen so others like it. brain fart on it. But yes, I mean, it definitely has helped with reduction of cramps. And it's going to come to me. I'm going to think of it um, here shortly. The one the one brand. But yes, it's a bunch of sodium and usually a few other little things like magnesium, a little bit potassium, something like that. But, but predominantly 
sodium right. that's present in there. So, I know yes. people look at me funny, you know, especially non-active, say, relatives or friends or whatever, when they see how much salt I will put on foods at times because they think of me as, you're the healthy guy that does the healthy things and what have right. you. And then it's like, crank the salt shaker. And they're like, what are yeah. you? But, you know, no, I have no blood pressure issues no. that would contraindicate yeah. that. And yeah. uh, certainly high sweat rate. So yeah. by all means, you know. Uh, and let anyone rub their hand across your arm after you've done a drink. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, it. My daughter has kicked, kissed my face after I was, ra- when I was training for my half. Right. And she's like, you're so salty. <laughs> she's four. Right. And so it was just totally, of course, all my sweat for my long right. runs. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yes, your sodium needs are higher. This is not the time. It, it, of course. I need to watch what I say there. If you have high blood right. pressure, you need to talk to your doctor about that. You right. know, in terms of your exactly. sodium intake. But you are excreting a whole lot more salt. Your needs, even if you do have high blood pressure, would be higher than a non-active training athlete who has high blood pressure. So. Exactly. Well, and, and the other thing, too, that just gets kicked around a lot out there is the sports strengths. You mm-hmm. know, you get, once again, some very passionate opinions on people, especially mm-hmm. with your more name brand Gatorade and Powerade if this mm-hmm. is basically sugar you know and, and this is basically soda with a sport type yeah. you know twist on it yeah. and and then of course a lot of companies that are claiming to offer more alternative things with with lower sugar where where do you come in on that as far as yeah. I mean obviously some of that sugar might be a source of energy but then right. again it's it's sugary as far as the quality, how concerned should people be about that? Right. And what works for people? Um, when I first started working with training, like doing nutrition classes for half marathons, I came across a really great homemade sports drink with coconut water, orange juice, and salt. And the sodium content and the potassium content in that were a whole lot higher than hmm. actually your Gatorades per one cup serving. Carbohydrates were quite equivalent. So I think if you turn it around and look at the numbers kind of per right. serving, you'd be able to really see, you know, what it is giving you. Predominantly, we are all mostly sodium um, sweaters. But mm-hmm. when I've been going through various sports nutrition thing, that's not to say that someone doesn't need magnesium, right? And so that's where right. you would really need to look in a little bit more if you're having cramping issues, delving in a little bit further and seeing are you more of a magnesium sweater on top of the sodium and eating a little bit more magnesium? But coconut water is giving more potassium as is the orange juice is giving more potassium. And then the salt, of course, is your sodium source there. Gotcha. So um, how would one determine if they're a magnesium sweater? Is that a test that's done or? Yeah, I knew you'd ask that. (laughs) (laughs) It is a test that's done. And I, and and I'm not going to be able to pull that off the top of my head, unfortunately, as to how that could be analyzed, but it can be analyzed. But, um, here, we'll do some internet research. Ooh, yeah. Magnesium sweat test. Let's see. Oh, yeah. There we go. Or yeah. Sweat composition. Sweat comp. Yep. Absolutely. Sweating rate and sweating composition. That's in the National Institutes of Health. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it looks like it's it's generally just like a sweat test and, and that, uh, analyzing the contents thereof. Cool. So yes. that, that makes obviously sense. They, I'm sure you can collect that somehow and analyze chemically what is in there. Uh, and that'd be obviously for somebody who's you know, cramping issues are not solved by your standard stuff. Right. You're kind of escalating that uh, as it goes along. Uh, another thing, yeah. we've mentioned food, logging what you eat to mm-hmm. some degree uh, several times now. And, you know, a lot of triathletes are so numbers obsessed. I know right. I've been guilty of that before. What? I know, right? <laughs> and the, I guess, as far as being helpful, how helpful do you find like a My Fitness Pal sort of tool? Mm-hmm. Because obviously it offers the positives of literally if you track everything, it's got so much information. On the other hand, you make something at home and you've got to add 18 different ingredients to your right. recipe and then wonder, yeah. did I get actually eight, one eighth of that, sir? Right. I know. I know. Especially for the obsessors. That's a tough one. And I love my fitness pal and I use it in my practice. I really, really do. It does have flaws though, right? It is a database where anybody can input anything. Mm, so I've yes. come across things where I'm looking at someone's food journal. I'm like, why is their fat super high? Why does it say like 93 grams of fat on this food item? Why is the Hershey bar 10 calories? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Somebody like missed hit and put like 93 grams of fat on like right. Brussels sprouts. There's no way your fat is overestimated. Don't worry about it. You know, you it's just like boil them in. <laughs> right. I'm like, what happened Douse here? them in butter. And, mm. So it can give a kind of an idea of what's going on. But homemade foods are super hard. They really, really are. But the whole point of it is to be some sort of accountability. It is not going to be exactly 
you know, how many calories you had. And there's going to be flaws in your technology that tracks your calories burned to, whether it's the yes. heart mate monitor slipped or the wrist read didn't, you know, it slipped and didn't quite catch a read, but it's giving us at least a ballpark. So whether it is my fitness pal, if you hate my fitness pal, fine, then do some sort of thing that does pictures. I think pictures can be nice because it's just, again, meant to be an accountability tool. You are supposed to go back and look at it if it's accountability tool, <laughs> right? And let it help dictate later food choices. It's not homework, right? No one's <laughs> checking it. It is supposed to literally help with food choice. So paper and pen is not a problem. If you're someone that likes to write it down, if you're a little bit more tech savvy and, and want the photos, it's not going to equate to a number for you if you're a numbers kind of person. But if you are, again, going to those weight kind of composition change um looking to lose fat and you forget that somebody brought muffins into the office that morning and you had a muffin and you're trying to justify let's say ice cream later that evening looking back at that and seeing that oh yeah yeah i totally forgot we totally had that big muffin that's not the best choice and i'm trying to make body composition changes you know or if it is in season and you're um just, just kind of think through it logically. Do you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. That's really what I'm looking yeah. for. So. I know. I know one of those people probably posting to my fitness pal and inputting stuff that's maybe less than correct. Maybe my middle school health teacher, <laughs> not a registered dietitian. So they don't have to kick them out of the practice who once proclaimed green leafy vegetables is an awesome source of protein. Oh, uh, yes. Even in sixth grade, I was a little bit confused by that because right. I kind of knew what protein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing, like, you know, because several years ago, I mean, I went through a big weight loss journey myself. I know. Myself. And I have to tell you, you look awesome. I forgot. Thanks. <laughs> so, but I mean, I did. I used my fitness pal. Yeah. And the thing that, and I was religious about it. I mean, I tracked everything for like, yeah over a year and I lost a ton of weight and probably lost it too fast and you know okay. but either way one of the things that that exercise taught me more than anything was just mm -hmm. what food is made up of right you know so yeah. I don't use it anymore I don't I mean I, I mentally kind of keep track of what I've done through the day and, mm -hmm. and try to just you know make healthy choices and whatnot as I'm as I'm going through the day but at the same time it's like I, I have a realistic you know picture in my head of what I am eating, yep. you know, so even if that I'm not actively, actively tracking anything subconsciously, I'm still, you know, I know that, okay, I had, you know, I had shawarma for dinner. So, you know, I've had, but I did that because I had, you know, something healthy for lunch. So right. I, I had that extra little bit in there. I knew I for could sure. get away with something a little bit bigger. For You're dinner, still so. holding yourself accountable in yeah. your own head, you know, not, not obsessively and not in a bad way, you, you know, just having that in the same way Good that, you know, in the food. same way that, that I, that I keep track of what my, my workout plan is for the day. You know, exactly. I know what my workouts are. I know if I don't hit the workouts, then I'm, you know, I'd probably make those up later or whatever, yeah. but food's kind of the same way for me. It's Absolutely. Like, so. And that's another, that, that's another approach to it too. But I do love that you've already gone through and taught yourself that you can kind of quote off calories of food to the same way I can, right? Yeah, I can tell you about how many calories are in the <laughs> right. things. Rough and ballparks. Right. At ballparks, least within, yes. within the ballpark. You know? yeah. Right. And it doesn't right. have to be precise. Like, is it going to really make that big of a difference if you're off 25 calories? 50 calories is not. No, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. I must say, if you do say shawarma one more time, we're charging them for a sponsorship. Uh, but it was so I've good. Never even Probably had it. There we go. <laughs> we'll send them the bill later. <laughs> it's just a fun it. word to say, too. I it know. It is. It's fun. It is fun. <laughs> Ready to take on that first Ironman, improve your next century ride time, or just build up from a sprint triathlon to your next bucket list event? Let LB Endurance Coaching be your guide on the journey. Head coach Lana Burrell brings her racing experience, coaching acumen, and education to craft a training experience that invigorates and challenges triathletes, cyclists, runners, and swimmers. LB Endurance offers one-on-one -on -one coaching, clinics, classes, training camps, and consultation. Certified, insured, and embracing the best of today's technology, Lana will turn you into a legit badass. Visit lbendurance.com to learn more and like LB Endurance on Facebook. As we covered some of the, the stuff that floats around out there that are nutritional myths or, or even just mm -hmm. uh, you know information that's less than reliable or less than ideal, and this may be a hard choice for you, but if you had the power to just permanently kill one nutritional myth that will not go away that you see with your clients especially anyone maybe with athletes if there was one that you could just make disappear from everyone's memory today what would that be 
Right. So this was a hard one. I had to consider my audience. I'm going to go back to the ketogenic thing for a little bit because I don't really necessarily have a problem with the ketogenic diet, but I'm considering the population that I'm working with right. and that carbs being super important to performance. Right. But something that really does bother me is that there's this belief that like bananas are bad or a certain other like fruit is bad or that, you know, potatoes are bad. And I just feel that whole foods can't be bad, right? Mm -hmm. The banana has three grams of fiber. It has potassium to it. It's 100 calories. Okay, the potato has 25 carbs to it. If you eat the skin, there's fiber and it has potassium to it. It's a great carbohydrate source for anyone, even right. my diabetics, okay? If, if you're my diabetic, it's on a ketogenic diet, then I get it, you're not gonna do it. But you're also probably not going to be training for a triathlon. Um, you know, so this idea of demonizing food and, and not being okay with like whole real food, but being way okay with an over-processed um, food item that has artificial sweeteners in it, a bunch of additives, preservatives, that's okay. You know, so right. whole real food is okay with me and it can have a place. It might be changing the serving size depending on training needs, medical conditions, those kind of things, but I don't like demonizing a whole food. So here's an, another side me. of that, and this kind of plays off of, of that same thing. You, <laughs> you mentioned potatoes. Yeah. Okay. Sweet potatoes, right. regular potatoes. Everyone's like, oh, sweet potatoes are way better than regular potatoes. Are they really? Right. So go to nutritiondata.com and you can look me up and check me. Um, but you can go to nutritiondata.com, type in sweet potato, one medium sweet potato, okay? Find the carbohydrates on it, roughly 25, okay? And there's four grams of fiber in that, okay? For our net carbers, we're looking at 21 grams carb. And then we could go to the white potato of the same size, going to be about 25 grams of carbs if you eat the skin four grams of fiber <laughs> Why would you not right so if you eat the skin of the white potato then it's okay all right there's great potassium in both again if you're a kidney dialysis patient then you don't you should watch your potassium but and if you are a dialysis patient or join triathlons then i think you're awesome yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah. there are i have heard of a few <laughs> have yeah. you really yes. i love it i absolutely love it but they are ones that certainly, you know, that that that's that's serious. Like they're super yeah. <laughs> dedicated then because they're dialyzing, they're having those electrolytes checked all the time, and, and they're needing them. You know, yeah. more so they've right, got a right. whole lot more complicated situation than than everyone else does. Right. But um, to to demonize those, they're both really the same. Eat the skins on those white potatoes. If you don't like skins, yes, there's bonus fiber in the skin on the sweet potato, but there is actually more fiber in the flesh on the sweet potato, mm -hmm. right? And so we like that. And I have seen some paleo forms allowing the white potatoes back in because of the potassium content that's in them, mm, right? right? So eventually they're kind of having to soften the extreme. <laughs> Everyone, you know, and this is not a judgment. And I mean, I can, I, I don't know that I could do paleo or any other really specialized diet like that. Right. Um, Everyone that I've ever known personally that's done that is just a really intense person in mm -hmm. all aspects of life. And I think they have found a diet that matches their life right. intensity in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, maybe if they're focused enough, you know, they're actually getting the stuff and it works for them. Although it just, you know, it boggles my mind the complications it can cause, too, is just trying to, to make sure it corresponds to that very narrow right. uh, outlook right there but. but i love what you said there because there is absolutely no one size fits all there's going to be triathletes that are listening and saying you know what? i do the ketogenic diet and i do a little bit more carb on race day and it all works out and and that is awesome for me because i love it i love the creativity of of the recipes that come about in there i feel better xyz element of p all the symptoms to what for them is great right so there really is actually no one size fits all which is why, again, I would encourage working with a dietitian. I have people on ketogenic diets. I do, right. you know, and I've got that are that don't have epilepsy. Right. <laughs> they don't have that the are passing out. Reason, yes, you know, for having it. Um, so I have people on really all kinds of diets: vegans, vegetarians. I have clients that are Muslim that are very, very strict, and I have ones that are just really looking to um, just have general health and performance, you know, um, but maybe have texture issues mm -hmm. or don't like this vegetable or don't like that vegetable. Fine. <laughs> That's totally fine. Like I have to make a plan for them that meets their needs and it's something that they'll do. So there's no one way to get to whatever your goals are. Weight loss, performance or anything. So definitely understand the texture issue thing. That that was yeah. what held me back for many years. Yeah. Many, many years. It's interesting. There's a it, lot it's of weird, it that comes isn't it? out. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, 
<laughs> but I can't so, say it's weird. I'm like, I get it. It's a texture problem. Okay, you don't like oatmeal. Cool. Talk to me about uh, cottage cheese. Oh, okay, fine. We have other protein sources other than cottage cheese. We have other high um, fiber carbohydrate sources other than oatmeal, right? So I'll work around it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know>? Nice. <laughs> and probably quote everything it. from memory too. Absolutely exactly. amazing. <laughs> yes. What lives up in your head for sure. I'll never um, be able to shake it. <laughs> uh, I know, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Do you just walk through grocery stores and that just pops out all the foods as you go by? It's just popping into your head what they are? and Yeah. I'd say the harder part is that if I'm getting something for the family or if somebody sees me, they think I'm judging their cart and I think they're judging my <laughs> cart. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, yep. this one's not for me. They're like, this is not for me. I'm like, I don't even care. <laughs> or like when we go out to eat and they're like waiting for me to order and like everyone orders the same thing. I'm like, I just order what you want. I'm going to order what I want. Right. Or like, I can't believe you got dessert. I'm going to have dessert. Like, it's okay. I'm going to eat. Right. <laughs> you know? So, so that's not on the, the clock right part. now. Not on the clock. I We're know. good. Right. People think I'm looking at their foods, and so that that's the harder issue. I'd right. Say, when people get around me, so. uh, I'm sure. I'm sure of that. <laughs> This is something we covered a little bit before, but I know one of the big things that you've done in your practice is putting out recipes for people because, yeah. you know, it's for one, putting together stuff that's not the same old, same old, you know, mm -hmm. stuff over and over again, trying to keep um, a healthy track. I mean, that, that's hard to do if you're not paying attention to it. And it's very easy just to, you know, pull something out of the freezer and warm it up and yeah. call it good. And of course, these crazy triathletes, ourselves included, have decided to take on a part-time unpaid job that requires burning a lot of calories and spending way too much money. Right. And so <laughs> then we're like, okay, so we've been out biking till eight o'clock on a weeknight mm -hmm. and we got to eat something. And, you yeah. know, before we go to bed and, you know, it, it's, it's hard sometimes to pull out those high quality meals mm -hmm. off the top of your head since mm -hmm. you already obviously have this yeah. amazing yeah. memory we'll what, what are some do. what are some examples of kind of high quality meals that mm -hmm. are just really quick to prepare the thing you go to if it's like oh, i've got 10 minutes to whip something together mm -hmm. right so i'm always building a puzzle so everyone think mm -hmm. your head is a circle right now cut your circle in half okay on the big half i'm looking for fruits and yep. vegetables for my triathletes right because you need those carbs from the fruits Weight loss, wage management, not in training. That's all veggie, mm -hmm. okay? Then a quarter is going to go to a lean protein, okay? Then the other quarter is going to go to a complex carbohydrate. I'm doing a weight management plate right now for you. It'd be more carbohydrate potentially for you when you're in competition, and you'll see that on the website. But um, lean protein, okay? I don't have time to cook chicken. I don't have time to cook salmon. Cottage cheese, one cup. 26 grams of protein that is just as nice. much as four ounces of chicken of salmon whatever right so cottage cheese greek yogurt same thing about 24 grams of protein there okay so again non-cooking kind of things they right. might not be the most exciting i'm meals, thinking that this week right? because i think i've had chicken maybe four times this week i've got 40 pounds in my freezer and like i like chicken but i'm kind of done with it done with chicken i need a break from chicken need a break yes. from it Absolutely. So you could do some stuff with cottage cheese there, right? You could, of course, have the fish. I'm kind of running down my little grocery list in my head that I like go through with right. clients. There's some really good bean pastas actually out there, and there's a specific brand. Can I say a brand? Yeah. Okay. Um, Explore Asian is the brand, and it has 25 grams of protein in one cup, and the carbohydrates on there are about like 12. So you'd still want to put some kind of carb with it, but it's a really good kind of thing to do with a stir fry. So there's like a black bean version that's better as a stir fry. And then the edamame version can be a good like spaghetti mm. substitute. Right, that sounds good. Um, so you still again you need like to have like a garlic toast or something like that for for y'all with the for the carbs. carbs yeah, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's not a lot of carbs. Um, but that could be a good option there. Of course, just kind of quick and easy. We could use our powders if we have to, but we need to be adding in some other carbohydrates. I, you said chicken, but I think that the rotisserie chicken is kind of like my go-to. Like mm -hmm. I thought about doing it tonight, but then I went to Costco and did a quick Costco run and I got some salmon, you know, nice. so, you know, just doing kind of whatever's practical to you. There's really cool tools out there now too, like instant pots or other pressurized cookers or crock pots, you know, get a big like pork butt or something like that. And so planning is the big thing. How right? do you feel so, about, about just, you know, you can go to the Kroger or wherever you can buy just the pre-prepped frozen veg yeah you know i think it's not the season stuff i'm not talking yeah, about the like the ranch stuff. flavored broccoli or any right. of that garbage yes. i'm talking about just like yeah. frozen veg are you really if you go with that just to keep it on hand i mean yeah. are you losing nutrients because no, it's frozen it's or anything right. or? usually the nutrition quality is actually better 
sometimes mm-hmm. in the fresh stuff because it's like flash frozen upon picking when it's at peak ripeness. Whereas like the stuff that we buy fresh, just considering like where it comes from, like look at your apple, like, oh, it's from, I don't even know. Look at your real Maine. Yeah. Where is it from? Where Arizona? It from? So it had to be picked with enough time to mm-hmm. travel and sit in the store for a little bit, right? So the nutrient quality can be quite different there. So I really do like the frozen stuff. It's a great thing to keep on hand just to help with reduction of waste. Um, and you can steam those. You can roast them. So my kids at D-Ball tonight, I pulled out the frozen broccoli, cut, cut, pulled out the steam pot and just let it sit there. I didn't turn it on. I left the house, though, so it's defrosting a little bit. Dunstan gets home, turns that little sucker on. Boom, now it's going, you know. So doing little things like that to help yourself out if it is like frozen salmon or something like that, set it out while you're out training and so that the cook time, it's just going to go a little quicker for you, right? Yeah. Go shower, do your thing, and then it's going to be ready, you know, <laughs> while you're, you know, while it's cooking, go take a shower. Well, a lot so. of that has to do with just the, the tiniest bit of, pre-planning planning we're, huge. we're you know yeah. we're not talking and if you are one of those people that wants to make a week's worth of meals and have it ready because you know you're going to be busy more power to you by all means right. you know but that's also something that requires a lot of time and a lot of pre-planning that some people aren't just going to do right, right but just even the slightest thought about what you want to eat before the moment you're about to yeah. eat can be really helpful in in actually deciding to cook up whole foods at home rather than hit yeah. up the restaurant and negate your training on yeah, the yeah, way yeah. No, back. absolutely and that, that's a great thing to know because if you do end up doing something out and about what do those calories actually look like and what do you think ballpark you actually burned so right. when i was doing a segment um on the news on tuesday they had someone that had gone through a high intensity interval training and they had a heart rate monitor on they burned something like 564 calories okay so one medium cheese pizza regular amount of mm-hmm. pot, a regular amount of sauce regular amount of cheese how many calories do you think a medium cheese pizza is if you feel like that's justification 1500 so it's like it's um yeah it's like 1700 calories yeah yeah just under 1700 i remember from it's my like fitness 16, pal from my homemade yeah. pizza <laughs> well and it comes the calories that, that sneak up on you are from the crust i think yeah is really yeah. what that's it is because i crust yeah right because i i put in one in my fitness pal years ago and and put it in separately the crust and then the ingredients and i was floored by how many cal- right. calories were in the mm-hmm. crust right. yeah it's Especially if you're going thick crust, if you're going like pan pizzas right. and stuff, I mean, right. it's just yeah, tons. So let's say you're out for a training. Like, how many like calories y'all burn in a one hour training bout or two hour training bout? Right, you know, six hundred, six to eight hundred yeah. an hour on depending right. on Roughly. intensity. Yeah. Right. So maybe on a two hour workout, you could have that pizza, but that would be, you know, that could be all you had, you right. know. And and does that really fuel your? Are you really like refueling your body and recovering? No, not necessarily. We need to have carbs and protein. Yes, you have carbs. You have a lot of fat. But that's why you get the meat. Right. Fat. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There you go. And of course, on occasion, cheat meal once a week. Sure, do that. Right. But you know, if you're thinking, I need to make some, I know I'm, I'm really wanting to improve my performance. What are some things you can do a little bit differently? It's not to yes. say you never have the cheese pizza. I don't want to pick on that. But, right. you know, what are some, some areas you can work on um, right. changing there? And there are quick things. The rotisserie chicken, the frozen thing, and, and some kind of quick carb, you know, could certainly be a great meal. So so here's my post-workout pizza confession since we're yes. on the subject. <laughs> um, so I, I did a, you know, metric century ride with my brother in Georgia two years ago, I guess now. And uh, we went down there and, and rode a specific trail. And so he, you know, he, he's got a hybrid bike. He's a little bit slower. So I'd say it's probably four and a half hours or so. Okay. Pretty light intensity. I don't know. I forget my calorie count from the day, but it was, you know, probably 2,000 ish total calories burned. And uh, I've got a gluten sensitivity. So there are very few pizza places I can go, right. though far more now than there used to be. And I went to, I'm going to name a brand here, the Mellow Mushroom in Rome, Georgia. And I had been (laughs) to Mellow Mushrooms before. And like most places that serve a gluten-free pizza, uh, it's a small, you know. So I thought, okay, that's fine, you know, whatever, because we're staying in a hotel. and We're going to go to a baseball game right after, so we weren't going to go back to the hotel. So I thought, okay, well, I'll get a small pizza. And I decided to cheat and now i'm going to do the meat lovers when i throw it all on there all the cholesterol i can handle right exactly well that particular establishment served something that was actually more between a medium and a large (laughs) 
so you KO'd it, didn't you? I I did. I sat there. I was yeah, so miserable. <laughs> but you know, because it's gluten free, it's like twenty five dollars or something stupid oh, like yeah, that. Is. You know, especially yeah, with is. the meat loaded up on there, and I'm like, this is like two dollars a slice. I'm not leaving any, but yeah. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, that was a <laughs> that was a day. Gluten free. It's not healthy. Yeah, I know, right? That makes it healthy, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. My favorite. My there favorite are one people, was... and I am one of them too. I have to say, I I cannot tolerate gluten, so I'm not picking on it. But right. I don't like when Talk I get trendy. thrown out mm-hmm. as saying that that like negates the calories because it doesn't. Right? right. There, there's still calories present. You still felt miserable. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> After your it didn't. Yeah. Big four hour <laughs> ride. Yeah. So. That was. That's crazy. Yeah, gluten-free is thrown out there. Uh, organic is right. thrown out there. And that's another good one, you know, because, I mean, are there is there any benefit to some of the organic vegetable products? I know mm-hmm. I've seen some things labeled organic that I'm like, how could it not be? You know, right. this water is organic. Right. You know? It's like applesauce is listed as cholesterol-free. You don't expect it. <laughs> Cholesterol is only in animal sources. Right. You know, yeah. so it's right. a nice marketing tool, right? Yeah. But, okay, so the organics thing. There is an organization that does go through and say, okay, these are the clean 15 and these are the dirty dozen. So Mm -hmm. clean 15 are those fruits and vegetables that don't um, attract a lot of pests and then don't require a lot of pesticides or herbicides. So then those pesticide and herbicide content of them are quite lesser. And then the dirty dozen are the ones that do attract a lot of pests and then therefore a lot of pesticides, herbicides, those kind of things. So typically a thin skin that you don't consume is 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 in the okay. It's like the clean mm-hmm. category. But there are some weird things like asparagus is on that list too and it doesn't mm-hmm. really have a protective skin. But like corn is over on that side too. Right. Pineapple, avocados, those kind of things. Um, apple, spinach, you know, the lettuce, those kind of things on the dirty list. And so what is the difference there? Okay, the vitamin and mineral content between the organics and the conventionally grown should be about the same. Okay, when you look up on nutrition data or something like that, again, you should see a roundabout how much, you know, potassium is in the apple, how much of the various other nutrients that are in there. Um, The difference is, is do you want to have that pesticide residue, which is why some people like to look at those organics. Um, If it's going to come down to kind of dollars and cents, you will not eat the produce because if it's Mm -hmm. not organic, I want you eating it still. You're going to be getting the phytochemicals of the antioxidants in that versus not, you know, and you're getting environmental toxins and all this other kind of stuff too. Like we can overthink any one thing. So kind of- There are germs everywhere. Yes. (laughs) So kind of look at your dollars and cents. You know, if you have the budget to put into organics, then sure, I would encourage it. But if it's going to come down to, I can't eat it if it's, you know, not organic, then I just don't buy it. I think that's a problem too. Mm -hmm. So- It um, falls into the category of marginal improvement. Right. You know, you can afford it. If it makes a difference, by all means, it's not harmful to do it, but at the same time, you know- yeah, you can't you can't be choosing to eat steak every night or something, you know. In its place. And what can you do kind of maybe smartly with your budget? Like, can you be sure to coupon your paper towels and toilet paper? Can you do some kind of subscribe and save type of option where, like, it's delivered your house or go to, you know, big stores like Costco or Sam's or something? Kind of get some, some savings in, in some realm so that you can spend a little bit more on some other things like that, whether it be the organic produce or, like, or even the or- organic proteins. Um, so that raises a really good question. If, you know, what sort of categories or types of food are really kind of that you would recommend spending more on and Mm -hmm. ones that are, ah, just go for the cheap variety or go for a store brand or go for a generic, whatever, you know, what, what things are the, you should really put money into this. This is quality and this is. Yeah. I go back and forth with it because it's hard because you're going to get some labeling things like right. hormone free on products that never actually have ever right. had hormones in them. <laughs> Marketers so are liars. Marketing is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right. So like pork has never been injected with hormones, you know, right. so for them to say hormone free, you know, okay, great. So any of all, any and all of your pork should be fine. So it's going to be really educating yourself as to which things would have potentially have had those hormones in them. Um, And then you have to look at two kind of like your personal preferences. Like, do you prefer that your chicken got to run around? Like, and that's fine. Right. There's ethical considerations too, certainly when you get to the vegan and vegetarian, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so those are some things to look at there as well. The antibiotic use, the antibiotics, you know, are used to help prevent disease, you know, but then there's an argument about antibiotic resistance, you know, so you can really look at it both ways and that's where it gets really really complicated um but the trumping out thing is usually the dollars that come to it there's totally a a more expensive cost associated with it 
Um, so you'll have to kind of weigh out kind of your beliefs, right. your your money. You're going for your best case scenario mm-hmm. that you can, you know, do that. And once again, same thing with like chicken. You know, mm-hmm. maybe it'd be preferable or there might be an advantage to non-antibiotic. But if you're going to decide to eat red meat all the time right. instead because it's cheaper or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. than, than, the, than the non-antibiotic chicken, then just do the chicken. It's better. You're right. moving that ball yeah. forward. And I'd, you know, argue having like a moderation approach to it, too. Mm -hmm. So just because this week you couldn't afford to have it or this month you couldn't afford your organic product, it's not going to hurt you for one month if you ended up doing, you know, and you tempered it in a balanced way. Maybe you don't do as much of the prepared box stuff that comes in individual packages because that all costs more, right? So a really big evaluation of where you're spending your money and what's more important to you? But to kind of go back to what you originally asked me, right. like the produce and the animal products right. would be encouraged as to going to those organic sources if you can. Right. You know? Um, but it's not necessarily say that you have to either, you know? So 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 just keep that in mind. You're going to be balancing that diet overall by having fresh fruits and vegetables that have all the antioxidants in it that are right. going to prevent the big C word that everyone wants. You know, mm-hmm. when there, again, there's genetic factors that, that would be playing a role in, in cancer and all that. So don't don't demonize food and don't think you can't have a, a certain food item because it's not organic and it's going to give me cancer if I don't. You know, right. like we go to these crazy extremes with food and we really start to demonize certain things when if we kind of just step back look at the moderation approach and take it into balance exactly good. all right so this is the question the, the gotcha question for every dietitian or nutritionist out there what is your favorite food that is not good in any way shape or mm. form but that you cannot live without oh this i gotta hear yeah <laughs> no no so i think i have like a lot of things um I'll go with my dessert answer. Number one is creme mm-hmm. brulee. That's my absolute favorite. The crystallized oh, nice. sugar on top. Mm-hmm. Nice yeah. Love that stuff. Um, hmm, probably kind of thinking along the lines of like entree stuff. I do love sushi. I really, really do. And I know we think that's healthy, but there, I mean, it can or can't be. Right. It typically lacks a big vegetable mm-hmm. um, for weight loss, weight management. So I definitely love that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't do pizza or anything like that just because my gluten issue so i'm not right. a pizza gluten type of girl i'm a dessert girl like i love sweet mm-hmm. stuff chocolate creme brulee who doesn't like I love told good you. sweets i'm like so that's that's the direction i'm gonna go mm-hmm. like just chocolate and well and, and part and of the stuff part of the uh, thing of that i'm sure too for you is is that you probably like a specific type of it prepared just so right, yeah. you know like if you're gonna spend the calories on it it's yeah. got to be darn good yes. i know uh we talked to a pro cyclist phil guyman uh, about three or four months ago on the show and he his reputation in the tour de france was he was the cookie guy and he's retired now and he holds these cookie you know rides and what have you and will hand them out to pro cyclists during a race right. and has jersey like he's all about cookie that's like his thing but he is a cookie snob he will yes. not eat a poor quality cookie. Love it. And, you know, yes. I mean, he's biking, you know, even in retirement, probably 20 hours a week or something stupid like that. You know, like <laughs> yeah. he's got mm-hmm. he's got the, the capacity for that. But yeah. his point was, I am just not going to eat, you know, and he actually will post reviews and whatnot. Like, don't eat yeah. this cookie. It's not That's worth it. So... Yeah. I'm going to respect the guy. That. Like the, the chocolate chip cookie. I mean, there, there's right. something about the chocolate chip cookie. It's right. It really is almost the perfect dessert. Yeah. I mean, it in, is. A, in a lot of ways. It as really I've is. As I make gluten-free ones, like with various like almond flours and things like that, they're never as good as when I make them for my kids with like real flour. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I don't know. It just doesn't, it doesn't work out. But I'm glad you said cookies because I really love icing. Like I will oh, lick mm-hmm. icing off cupcakes, wedding mm-hmm. cakes. Just give me all the frosting, like buttercream frosting. Buttercream, yes. Ah, I'm so I'm going to I'm going to brag on myself here with my limited <laughs> baking experience and whatnot. So so my wife Jen runs Ragnar Tennessee with uh, Ansley's Angels uh, organization that's helping disabled people puts awesome. them in, in chairs, kids in, in this case in this race, and they push the chair from. Uh, well, they didn't have the chair in every leg, but Chattanooga to Nashville, 190 some miles. She was part of that relay team wow. uh, of 12 right there. And so I decide as I'm home alone for the weekend before I meet her in Nashville that I'm going to make cookie cake. That is her thing. I've publicly outed her cookie cake obsession. <laughs> and I had the recipe and whatnot. And I will, I, the one thing I've neglected to realize is that our stove or our oven is gas and no. it burns things like crazy. Ooh. And so, um, 
I ended up with basically black and charred. <laughs> yeah, it was not it was not good at all. But the but the I had never made frosting in my life. Yeah. And that was some of the best frosting I totally had. Is. I nice. nailed the frosting. So frosting next time on the cookie shit. cake, we'll get that. Or we'll next time you just that. go to the cookie store at the mall and then I make your own yeah. frosting. <laughs> well, see, I tried to make it gluten-free because I wanted some of it, too. Exactly. Uh, That's the hard now thing, the, too. Yeah. Yeah. The truth comes out. The truth comes out. It wasn't Excellent. just for Jen. It was for ah, nice. yes. Look what I made you, dear. <laughs> it's pretty good. I tried it. <laughs> Half of it's gone. Yeah. Love it. Oh, how sweet. You made me half a cookie, a cookie cake. cake. <laughs> I was smarter than that. <laughs> so funny. so for our, our local listeners here, obviously, in, yeah. in Knoxville, uh, obviously, you're available and, yeah. and willing to, to take people on. Yes. I know the website is andreard.com. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And how else right. can people connect with you? That'd be the best way. There's a contact there or you yep. know, email. And you're on Facebook as well. Thing. I'm on Facebook. Just mm-hmm. Andrea Kendrick RD. Um, and there's recipes on Facebook quite recipe. frequently, so yeah. so like check that out. Even up. for if you even if you're out of town, check that out. Exactly. And I've just hired an assistant just to help with management of my business, which is great. And so um, I would prefer website kind of contacts or um, emails Absolutely. or something like that rather than just phone calls. Unfortunately, <laughs> right, right now. Yeah. And if you want to <laughs> chat, to let me know in the email. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We so. don't want to. We don't want to send too many people your way. Well, yeah, Andrea, I thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast and uh, glad to hear the business is going well. So much yeah. info. I mean, us triathletes could talk about this until, you know, the wee hours of the morning. Yes. You could say there's a lot to digest. There uh, is. This podcast. Quite, quite, quite a good ah, pun. Ah, <laughs> ah, on ah. that terrible pun. <gasps> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks so much. <laughs> Just a reminder, our upcoming shows, Josh Sprague, Sprague of Orange Mud's going to be here next week, joining us to talk about his adventures and being an endurance athlete and entrepreneur. Look for that in your podcast feed in a week or so. Let us know you want you want to hear on upcoming shows and any guests you'd like to see on the show by emailing us from our website, losttransition.com. Shoot us a note on Facebook or Twitter. And while you're at it, do a small favor, rate and review us on your podcast app. It lets us hear from you and also reach more triathletes out there. We'll talk to you again soon. May all your transitions be smooth.